please welcome Anna Roosevelt. And the early paleo diet is not what you think. Glass Global Exploration. Thank you, Richard. And I'd like to thank the Explorers Club, the GLEX team, uh, the local team, the islands, a uh, wonderful mayor, and the uh, assistants, uh, sometimes long distance, of the uh, minister of the economy who spoke so eloquently in the beginning. I'd like to thank everyone. So I'm, I'm going to perhaps give you a shock today. <laughs> um, I'm just not just talking about the history of the human diet. I'm talking about the environment of early human evolution. I, I actually can't, <laughs> can't see these slides very well. So um, this map, ha the, these maps that show you the Miocene large forest and the a huge savanna that is supposed to have replaced it during the Pleistocene glacials. This map was drawn before there was any dated paleo environmental information from Africa. So I, I'm trying to make the point for all of us that um, we want to be careful of theories that come before the data. Um, especially charismatic theories that wonderful uh, scientists with very prestigious institutions bring because they may be wrong. So we should always pursue the background of facts about these theories. So this is the refugium theory, the theory of the savanna origins of humans. Just to give you a sense of the countries that we'll be talking about, the uh, tropical countries of Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, and also parts of Southern Africa, including Mozambique, which is a, an, is a former colony of Portugal. These are the kinds of, of technologies for research that needed to be put to the question of what was the environment of human evolution and why is that important? So some of these um, technologies have to do with sedimentology. That's a very important one I'm going to be discussing. There's also hydrology and palynology, the study of ancient pollen, which is one of the one of the ways you can look at ancient, ancient uh, environment and forests and other kinds of habitats. Also, uh, critical ecology and behavioral biology, human osteology, those are all technologies we can apply to the question of what was the environment of human evolution. So the theory that has been the consensus that all of us were taught in school is the savanna origin of humans. So it's, it's an environmental determinist theory. It says that there was a change in the environment and that allowed the human species to emerge. The idea is that the uh, ancient forest apes were suddenly bereft of their forest habitat and they had to take, make up stone tools to go big game hunting to get subsistence in the savanna because the foods they were reliant on from the forest uh, vanished. So here you can see an image of the idea of the apes in, can you see my pointer? I'm not sure it's there. You can see them um, uh, in, the, in the tree, descending from the tree, and then walking only because the savanna opened up. And here is a picture of the archetypal savanna of Africa, which is called the Bateke savanna. And these savannas are assumed by most uh, paleoenvironmentalists to be relics of the Pleistocene savannas. But that's a mistake, because they, that's not the age of these savannas. This is the kind of forest that is thought to have been effaced 
by the Pleistocene glacials. The idea was that it became cool, cold, and then dry because the ocean stopped evaporating as much moisture, and that led to drought in the tropics. But what we, na what we now know about the origin, the, the spatial origin of the water in the forests of, of both Amazonia and uh, Central Africa is that th th those forests are not mainly getting their water from the ocean, but they're getting them from the forest. And we'll talk about that in a minute. By the way, these are oil palms. So here you can see uh, one of the big savannas. It's in Gabon, near the Lope Reserve. And you can also see an important element that I'm going to talk about next, which is the assumptions that were made from the sedimentology of Africa. So uh, if you've ever looked at the paleoecology of Africa literature, you'll see there's the Kalahari sands. These are sands that are assumed to be dune sands from the aridity that was created in Central Africa and e West Africa and South Central Africa during the Pleistocene glacials. And they're sediments that are attributed to um, aeolian de deposition. Well, you'd think that it would not be difficult to tell if a deposit, a particular deposit, is from wind de deposition or from some other kind. But only recently has anybody looked at that issue. How do we tell what these red and white sands in central, in tropical Africa, uh, what formed them? Well, here you can see how they are formed, and they are forming under tropical rainforest. They are not forming in deserts. So here we see in the, um, these are uh, rocks being eroded in the upper headwaters of the Congo Basin under tropical rainforest. And you can see that it's the power of water and the elevated characteristics of the land that basically create the erosional situation. If you don't have a lot of rain falling, you don't have a lot of water to erode the rocks. So that's an, another issue about the, the desert hypothesis that's wrong. Here you see uh, a river in tropical rainforest, the Ngoligo River in Central African Republic, where one of the places where we work. And you can see that this river is, here's the rainforest, it's eroding rocks. And as the rocks are eroded, they break off and they get rounded. And eventually, you get sand at the bottom of the river. This is the lower Congo um, in the region of Brazzaville and Kinshasa. So, um, I want to quickly mention, I, I don't have a slide for it, but when the researchers uh, who um, did, worked on the NASA program imaging the Sahara uh, from the shuttle and also the Landsat camera on the ill-fated shuttle, um, they were able to see that under the sands of the Sahara was the drainage of an enormous river bigger than the Amazon. And they did ground truthing. Uh, Farouk El Baz was one of the members of that crew who will be receiving an honorary degree at my university next graduation. And what they did in, when they f went to the ground truthing, they found what had been attributed to a dune deposition, aeolian deposition of dunes in the Sahara, and found that their clay chemistry wasn't correct for that. It was kaolinitic which is a kind of clay that is formed under the, the chemical weathering, through chemical weathering of tropical rainforest. It does not form uh, through more desiccated and more um, minimalist plant habitats. So even in the Sahara, it's the same in parts of the Kalahari Desert itself, these are, are deposits that are alluvial. They come from the erosion and deposition of rivers in great tropical forests. So uh, 
in these um, deposits of Kalahari sands, that are, there are gravel beds with the cobbles that are eroded from these rivers. Why, why are those important? Well, first of all, because they carry diamonds. Because there are, in, the, in many places in the Congo drainage, there are kimberlite dikes that have been ignored. They're localized. And, but both the corporate mining companies and the artisanal ones, artisanal groups who are mining them, they um, do the laborious, time-consuming, costly uh, way of getting gold by looking through the sands that are produced from the erosion of the kimberlite. They could be developing community mines because these are localized deposits, and they could be going straight for the deposit. So can you see that no knowledge of the geoarchaeology can be important for future development? So these cobbly beds were not ignored by ancient human ancestors. And here at this site, which is deep in the bed of a modern river, the Yobe River in Central African Republic, near the Ngolio River, miners had found a deposit of diamonds and cobbles, but it had been, the cobble bed had been used to make tools by uh, Homo erectus, as best we can tell, because the types of tools that were found in the site, and here you, you cannot see the site here because it's underwater. We sandbagged it so, we, so it could be drained, so we could do excavation. Here, here is the region, it's the Sangha River region of the uh, forest, um, which is a tribu it, Sangha is a tributary of the Congo Basin, in, and it, it, it meets the Congo Basin in the Republic of Congo. And here is the cobbly bed that we looked at and we excavated. So when you dig a, a miner's site, you have to, the miners, by the way, throw the tools, the ancient tools that, that human ancestors made up on the surface to get them out of the way. And so we surveyed uh, many miles of the diamond mines in the Sangha River uh, over several years and looked at the kinds of tools they were throwing up. And when we got to Ngolio site, which is what you're looking at here, my Brazilian colleague, Maura Imacio Silveira, um, she, she called to me, Ana, when I was trying to negotiate with the elderly, um, at the time drunk, <laughs> Muslim leader of the tiny village. It was a, a multi-ethnic village of Muslim fishers who had moved there about, since about 1945, and a bunch of villagers speaking Bantu and some pygmies also speaking Bantu. And um, I was trying to negotiate with him to rent the, if we found tools, to rent the site. In fact, it was a pygmy who owned the site, so we rented it from him. Anyway, this is the, uh, Maura called me and she said, Anna, um, early Ashelean. And so there was, there was a hand axe on the surface and a bunch of other tools, um, flakes, that were typical of what Mary Leakey defined as being in bed two of Old Vi Gorge. So those tools are attributed to Homo erectus. So uh, we don't ha yet have a date, but we probably will because this layer here under the cobbly bed um, is volcanic tuff. And so there's a possibility of doing argon-argon dating on it. And it, it was very fresh when this cobbly bed formed. So when you have volcanic activity, um, often the surface will rise because uh, tuff will be deposited and then the rivers will erode. So you get a rather unstable situation. And that's really what happened here. Uh, the river drainage has changed during, after this uh, de deposition of volcanic tuff. And so they scored the rocks of the region and created this cobbly bed. So um, the tools are here, were here. And I'm going to show, th show them to you in a minute. Um, and although we didn't have plant remains from this level of the site, we did have clay 
and, and its kaolinitic clay, which, as I say, only forms through chemical weathering under tropical rainforest. The later deposits had a perfect preservation of typical uh, Gilbertiodendron-dominated uh, tropical forest. So here you can see, this is the first, our first uncovering of what the miners did, and later we removed all the disturbed layers, and we exposed about uh, four by two feet of the deposit and excavated it by hand, piece plot plotting. And here you can see one of the stages of the excavation. So here is um, a cobble. And here are flakes from, from the surface of a cobble. And I'll show you the tools that we found. Um, I'm not sure if any of them show here. Uh, maybe this is a nu nucleoid. Uh, let me show you in a second. Oh, so here's a close-up of some of the tools, and you can see the kaolinitic clay is here. So this is what's called a pick. Um, these are called discoidal cores. And I forget what, what tools were in that layer. So here, here is a drawing of some of the tools. And if any of you are interested in paleontology, uh, Paleoanthropology, just look at Mary Leakey's 1971 book, and you'll see tools exactly like this in bed two of Old Vi Gorge, lower bed two. Um, so here's, here's a, a small biface. Here are um, discoidal cores. This is a cleaver. These are um, picks. This is, this is um, the, uh, actually, this is the other side of that cleaver. I've also put, showed you a profile. This is a, uh, a core, a big core. Um, it's quite typical of discoidal cores for there to be cortex from the original weathered surface of the cobble. Can you see that here uh, and here? And you can imagine these discoid cores are, are produced by a, somebody taking a moderate sized cobble and hitting it all the way around and then turning it over and hitting it all the way around again. And probably what they were trying for is to get flakes. And there's many, there were 200 flakes in this smallish excavation. And I'll show you a couple of them here. They're typical, um, what some people call denticulates or some people call them awls. So that they're flakes that were flaked to make a little point to scrape something. Um, and then very important, there are um, spheroids and uh, polyhedrals, which, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute as important in the food system. So in, in, I'm going to uh, just show you a little bit of the environment. So this is the Gilbertiodendron forest, uh, which is, it's, um, these are um, forests all over the Congo Basin in the rainiest areas, and they, they, the, the trees that dominate have enormous pods this big full of food. They have a powdery arrow that people scrape off and, and put with water and make cakes or porridge, and then they have seeds. I don't have a picture of the seeds, I think. Oh, I, I do later. And, and uh, here is one of the pods. From the, from the excavation. Here are some oil palms. These are from the 2,000-year-old level of that excavation, um, but they show you the kind of pre food that prehistoric people in the rainforest had. And so I want to show you some information that will be important in a minute. Um, Tropical rainforest plants have a particular stable carbon isotope ratio, and that stable carbon isotope ratio, conveniently enough, does not overlap with the stable carbon isotope ratio of grass, of tropical grass. Cra tropical grasses and sedges have a different photosynthetic pattern called C4, whereas the rainforest plants have C3. So here I'm showing you a bunch of results of many parts of the, of the rainforest, both from our archaeological excavations here 
and from living forests that we sampled along with local pygmy women. And you'll see that they range between about minus 25 and about minus 32 per mil. Um, that's the stable carbon isotope ratio of 13 to 14. Remember, carbon-14 is not stable, it's radioactive. And then, uh, so tropical grasses have a stable carbon isotope ratio that ranges between minus 12 and uh, around minus 10 or, or 12 and minus 13 or 14. It, it doesn't overlap with the stable carbon isotope ratio of tropical rainforest. So, why do Paleoanthropologists think that there was a savanna during the emergence of human ancestors. Because of measurements made on low carbon containing sediment uh, in paleoanthropological sites in Africa. But look, look at the range. It's too positive. It's way different from even C4 plants. So how did the researchers explain that? They said there was an offset of between the decay of litter from vegetation and the creation of carbon in soil. But through there have been many, many examples of sampling in the tropical part of Africa that show there is no offset. So why would the results be po too positive for even carbon-4 plants, tropical grasses? Because they represent marine carbon, not plant carbon. So here you can see that many of the lakes that are studied, so most of the sediments that have been studied for these carbon studies um, sediment studies, they're lakes and floodplains that are in areas with cal calcareous rocks. And these are rocks that were formed uh, basically during the occupation of the continent all the times the ocean invaded. And can you see here in one lake that was studied, Lake Ossa in Cameroon, can you see all the calcareous rocks? And when the archaeologists looking at at the dates of the core for these pollen sites, when they looked at them, they found that the, the carbon of the sediment was much older than the carbon of the plant remains. That doesn't look good for that carbon being re related to the, plant re to the plant remains and to the forest. So, here is a, is a good picture of the importance of volcanism, exactly what we've heard about in other uh, lectures today. And all through Africa, there are nuclei of this, these activity for, I'm sorry, my, nuclei of possible vol volcanic activity. Uh, I want to say that Central African Republic has many deposits. Here is one, a volcanic uh, tuff. And here you see elephants uh, eating the tuff. They use, it as a, they use it as a mineral source and also to cover their skin to protect it from insects. And here is Mount Cameroon, which is a relatively recently active volcano. So volcanoes are the medium of the uplift of the calcareous material from the ancient marine seas, and after which it, it deposits, it erodes, it gets into water, and that's how it got into the paleoanthropological sites. So here is Olduvai. Um, you can see the valley here and the red beds. The, red, the oxidized red beds tell you something probably tropical rainforest. And then you see that, here's the strat stratigraphic profile. So most of the fauna from these paleoanthropological sites is not in situ. It's eroded, broken up, the hard parts are mainly present. This is an, is a, uh, this is an ele uh, elephant predecessor, it's one of the rarities of the in situ de deposition of articulated skeletons or nearly articulated skeletons. So a lot was concluded from the animal remains, but uh, zooarchaeologists have decided that 
these ancient faunas are mostly from floodplain and river habitat, uh, lake floodplain and river habitats. So they don't necessarily mean savanna, but at a certain point in the Miocene, the C4 grasses took over any areas that were in the sun. And of course, flood lake floodplains and river floodplains are exposed to the sun. So of course, these areas have C4 grasses. It does not mean that the, ter that the terra firma is not, is savanna and is not rainforest. So here you can see some of the former occupations of these these creatures, so um, elephants and um, cape, uh, the buffalo, as well as the um, bushbuck, those are animals that occupy the rainforest and prefer the rainforest. So elephants take shade in the daytime. They can't stay out in the sun. So their uh, paleontology suggests, according to zoologists, that they begin in the rainforest and the swamps, and then when the savannas came, they became exposed to them, and they manage there. The same is true. Uh, according to the zoologist of these other taxa. So I'm saying to you, it's not the easiest thing to, to decide what the uh, ecology of an extinct animal or of an, a fossil of a modern animal is without having the plants. So uh, this is just lets you see the bed two here. And uh, here, is, here is the old one tools, and these are the early Achillean, which are the kind we found. So this is the original idea for the Australopithecines, the first apes, the first walking apes. Um, so the paleontologists assumed that they were hunting with the rock tools. Of course, they didn't actually make tools yet, but th that they were in savanna. But now that people have in South Africa have researched the plant remains, uh, also in Ethiopia, uh, Ron Clark in South Africa and Tim White in Ethiopia, we find that the plants that they find are perfectly compatible with rainforest habitat. Um, lianas are what, uh, what Ron Clark found with this very well-preserved Australopithecine skeleton. And Celtis, a very important tropical forest tree, um, was one of the specimens found in large numbers in the sites of Tim White in Ethiopia in the Awash. Also, when we look at Australopithecine strontium isotope ratio, strontium calcium ratios, they look like a plant eater. So here are Australopithecines. This is the pattern of a plant eater, not of a meat eater. So there are a whole lot different lines of evidence. When we look at the, at the grass, Pollen, this is one of my final points. Grass pollen has been judged as showing savanna when it's not very common. Uh, it's when it's 50% of the pollen of a profile. But when, we, when researchers have looked at what is the pollen rain of a savanna, what is the pollen rain of a forest, there is no rain like a savanna in the prehistoric period. So savannas have 95 to 99% grass pollen, and uh, no, none of the prehistoric pollen records have that. So, so there are no prehistoric. Um, so this is the original view uh, of the early Homo, that they're living on animals. And here are some of the successors. This is the early early human, early modern homo from Ethiopia, from Tim White's, and all through the uh, tropical forest region, the tools related to these forms are found. And just to show you, this is a Pleistocene record, uh, late glacial maximum, about um, 30,000 to 20,000 years, and you can see that forest is dominating this pollen record. So the idea that the Pleistocene brought savannas to Africa, it's not held up by the pollen. And uh, I'm going to skip this, but this shows you what the, um, 
This is what savannas look like. And you can see here, savannas um, are surface at the top. You can see their stable carbon isotope ratio. Right below them, it's forests. That shows that the savanna is recent. And this is just more of the same evidence. So look, look at these kinds of foods, because that's the kind that your ancestors probably ate. These are the kinds of foods that, are relate, that come from the forest. You have oil palm, you have various tree fruits. These are the Gilbertiodendron seeds. So you have abundant food. And so uh, this is my final, uh, I'll, I'll get to my final slide. Um, so this map shows you the current vegetation of Africa. You need to take all the green and think of it as rainforest, because all of that was forest before 1500 AD when uh, globalization came to Africa and then as was assisted by the Industrial Revolution uh, with technology to make um, extraction and export of materials to be of magnitude. So what I'm saying is that the, 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 the environment of early human evolution all the way from the Pleistocene and Pliocene also to the arrival of colonists in Africa was rainforest. Therefore, as a primate and as a long-term uh, occupant of rainforest, our ancestors, uh, that the reason for our heart disease, diabetes, high levels of cancer, a lot of it comes from our eating the wrong food for our genetics. So that's, that's my conclusion from my research.